Good morning and welcome to Moderna's first quarter 2020 conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. If you are part of the press or media, please disconnect at this time. Following the formal remarks, we will open the call up for your questions. Please be advised that the call is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the call over to Lavina Talukdar, Head Investor Relations at Moderna. Please proceed. Thank you, Operator. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Moderna's conference call to discuss our first quarter 2020 business updates and financial results. You can access the press release issued this morning as well as the slides that we'll be reviewing by going to the investor section of our website. Speaking on today's call are Stefan Bonsell, our CEO, Tal Zax, our CMO, Stephen Hogue, our president, and Lawrence Kim, our CFO. Before we begin, please note that this conference call will include forward-looking statements. Please see slide two of the accompanying presentation and our SEC filings for important risk factors that could cause our actual performance and results to differ materially from those expressed or implied in these forward-looking statements. We undertake no obligation to update or revise the information provided on this call as a result of new information or future results or developments. With that, I will now turn the call over to Stefan. Thank you, Lavina, and good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the call. I hope you and your families are in good health. As you know, we believe mRNA has the potential to be a new class of medicines with the opportunity to address many unmet medical needs, with medicines with higher probability of technical success, with greater speed of research and clinical development versus traditional medicines, and with greater manufacturing capital efficiency and lower cost of goods than injectable recombinants. Given the unknowns of working with a new technology, we have been laser focused on managing risk, technology risk, biology risk, execution risk, and financing risk. As many of you know, 2019 was an important inflection year for Moderna. We reported clinically validating data from key programs in two of our modalities, prophylactic vaccines and systemic secreted and cell surface therapeutics. Data that we believe fundamentally changed the risk profile for each of these two modalities that we now call modalities. As a result, our strategy is to double down in these two core modalities with many important new development candidates. We have already announced five new development candidates in these core modalities since January 13th at the JP Morgan conference. Three new development candidates in infectious disease prophylactic vaccine and two in the systemic secreted and cell surface therapeutics modality. While we focus on doubling down in core modalities, we are still very interested in understanding the potential of our mRNA technology in our current exploratory modalities, cancer vaccine, intratumoral immune oncology, localized regenerative therapeutics, and systemic intracellular therapeutics. So when we think about the company, we basically have two distinct areas of focus. This is a significant point in our strategy. We have core modalities where we want to scale and invest, and exploratory modalities that continue to be a big driver for the company's future as we await clinical data to decide the path forward. So stepping back, I would like to share with you the progress of a company toward a new class of medicines. This is a strategic plan that we shared with you in February 2020. In the early days of a company, our goal was to enter the clinic safely. We spent years investing and developing mRNA science, formulation delivery, and manufacturing technologies. The company pivoted out of that growth phase when we entered the clinic with our H10 influenza vaccine in December 2015. In the clinic, our next goal was to learn how our technology was working or not. We explored our technology across six different modalities. We tested 16 different molecules in the clinic in a short four-year period. In 2019, we generated important data in two of these six modalities 
and identified our first two comorbidities, infectious disease prophylactic vaccines and systemic secreted and cell surface therapeutics. Early in the year, we entered a new phase of the company's development. Our goal for this next phase in our history is to file multiple BLAs while continuing our clinical programs in the four exploratory modalities and continue to invest aggressively in early research to invent new modalities such as our ongoing collaboration with Vertex. When we first presented this plan in early February this year, we had imagined that the next phase of growth of a company will have taken us three to four years. Our vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 virus, MR1273, is a major acceleration of our company's development. Today, we are very happy to announce that we received yesterday clearance from the FDA to proceed with phase two. It's just nine days from filing our IND on Monday, April 27th, the FDA gave us a green light. We intend to start the clinical trial as soon as safely possible. We've also announced this morning that we are finalizing the phase three protocol. And our aim is to start dosing the phase three in early summer 2020. This means that we have a potential for a BLA approval for mRNA 1273 in 2021. That is an acceleration of several years. This is the plan we had just months ago. Moderna should be a commercial company, sorry, Moderna should be a commercial stage company in 2021. That is two to three years ahead of our previous plans, plans we outlined just months ago. This is a unique opportunity. So we are working actively to get the company ready. To deliver on this acceleration of a company's plan, we're expanding our leadership team in areas where their expertise will be instrumental to allow us to successfully file several BLAs and be ready commercially. Today, we're announcing three new additions to the leadership roles of Moderna. First, Patrick Berstedt. Patrick joins Moderna as Senior Vice President, Commercial Vaccines. Patrick will report to me. Patrick Jones from Merck and Company, where he most recently was head of global marketing and commercial operation for the entire vaccine business at Merck. Patrick will start on June 1st. Patrick, like global initiatives, will focus on revenue growth and access expansion. A 20 plus year veteran in the biopharma industry, Patrick has held various leadership positions within the infectious disease and global health at Merck in the US, in Europe, but also in Asia. Second, Jackie Miller, Dr. Jackie Miller. Jackie will be joining Moderna on May 11th uh, from GSK as Senior Vice President, Infectious Disease Development. Jackie joins a company from GSK where she held a variety of leadership roles since 2005. Most recently, Jackie was a Vice President and Head, Clinical R&D and Epidemiology, where she built and led the Clinical and Epidemiology Research Team at the first GSK Vaccine Research and Development Center in the U.S. And third, Dr. Charbel Haber. Charbel joined Moderna on April 21st as Senior Vice President, Regulatory Affairs. Charbel Johnson from Biogen, where he served as Vice President global safety and regulatory science since 2017. In this role, he built and led the Global Regulatory Strategy Department, the Clinical Trial Application Group, and the Medical Writing Groups. Prior to Biogen, Dr. Haber was head of Global Regulatory Affairs for Immunology and Neurology at EMD Serrano. I am very excited to welcome Patrick, Jackie, and Charvel, and look forward to their contribution at Moderna as we embark on the commercial stage phase of our companies. It is a bittersweet moment to announce today the departure from the company of Dr. Lawrence Kim, our Chief Financial Officer. Lawrence joined the company in 2014 when the company was private. As some of you remember, it was a preclinical stage company with zero development candidates. Lawrence took a chance on Stephen Hogan and I 
and decided to leave a great job at Goldman Sachs to join us. The company is now public with 23 development candidates and preparing its first phase three. Laurent will manage with us for a smooth transition. He will do Moderna second quarter conference call in August with us before leaving the company. I am very thankful for Laurent's contribution over the years and for the constructive discussion he and I had about ensuring a smooth transition. There is never a good time for leadership transitions, but the company is very well capitalized with around $2.4 billion of capital to invest to create value. And we need to focus on the next phase readiness for the company to be commercial. We have retained Russell Reynolds for the search for more than our next CFO. We will focus on the CFO we as public company and commercial and global operation experience, given this is where Moderna is heading. Before I hand over to Tal for clinical updates, I wanted to take a few minutes to frame the opportunity in our vaccine modality. We believe mRNA has the potential to be a new class of vaccines, where each of the four drivers of value apply. We are very excited about the potential of our vaccines to drive this value. First, as we discussed, a very large opportunity, the ability to do first-in-class vaccines that do not have products on the market today to protect as many people as we can. Second, a relatively high probability of technical success. As we discussed at our vaccine day, Dr. Andrew Lowe from MIT has shown that from the start of a phase two, i.e. positive phase one, to approval, vaccines have 42% probability of approval. This is the highest probability amongst all categories of medicines in clinical trials. We think this is a very important value driver for this franchise. Third, we think an important driver is speed. Speed in the labs, even we have a platform, we can study many candidates in parallel in preclinical setting. Once we pick a development candidate to take into the clinic, we can do it very quickly, as we have shown recently with a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine going from design of a vaccine on January 13 to injecting the first human on March 16 in as little as 63 days. Finally, we believe the capital efficiency of our platform offers significant advantages over traditional vaccines. Because the manufacturing process to make a mRNA molecule is a cell-free manufacturing process, it can drive much lower capex than usual convenient protein manufacturing. The second dimension is the capex leverage across the value chain. For example, when we decided to go after SARS-CoV-2, we did not have to buy any new machine. Our team was able to leverage existing CapEx in a matter of days. With that overview, let me now turn over to Tal. Tal? Thank you, Stefan, and good morning, everyone. I'll start with a quick reminder on the data generated to date with our vaccines. In over 1,500 healthy volunteers and seven positive phase one data sets to date, we have observed a safety profile that's consistent with the safety of adjuvanted vaccines. And we've time and again demonstrated the ability to elicit an immune response in the form of neutralizing antibodies. I'll start with a high level progress on mRNA-1273, our vaccines against SARS-CoV-2, and we'll give more details shortly. As you heard from Stefan earlier, we have the FDA clearance to move into our phase two study, and we plan to start it shortly. The study will run in parallel with the NIH-run Phase I study, which has completed enrollment of the first three dose cohorts. Our CMV Phase II dose confirmation study is fully enrolled, and we still expect data readout to come in the third quarter of this year. Uh, despite having had some COVID-19-related disruptions. At our Vaccines Day on April 14th, we announced positive interim analysis of our Phase one study for our Zika vaccine. At the two lower doses of 10 microgram and 30 microgram, we achieved seroconversion rates of 94 and 100% respectively. The two higher dose cohorts of 100 microgram and 250 microgram are now fully enrolled. As a reminder, we paused our HMPV PIV3 Phase 1B study enrollment as a cautionary measure to protect children and their caregivers due to COVID-19 disruptions. Our RSV program with Merck continues. 
So this has been covered in detail, but just to quickly base everybody on the same place. Our SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, mRNA-1273, which was a subject of much work and discussion in the first quarter of this year, demonstrates the kind of speed that we believe the platform can provide. From first selection of a sequence by our scientists and our collaborators at NIAID on January 13, to the production of a clinical batch on February 7, 25 days later. That had been released by, 20, by February 24th, and by March 4th was associated with an open ID that the NIH had filed. This strong collaboration between us and NIAID led to this, uh, the trial opening within 63 days, and we've spoken about this before. On April 17th, we were awarded a contract from the U.S. government agency, BARDA, to accelerate the development. And on April 27th, we announced an IND was submitted to the U.S. FDA for the Phase II study. Last Friday, we announced a collaboration with Lonza to manufacture mRNA-1273 at scale with the goal of producing up to 1 billion doses a year. And, of course, today we announced the FDA clearance to start the Phase II part. In parallel, we have been working on the Phase three protocol, and uh, we are finalizing that with a name to start the study in the summer of 2020. The design of the Phase one study is on slide 17. The study started as a 45-subject trial with three dose cohorts, 25, 100, and 250 microgram, with each participant receiving two vaccinations a month apart. These three dose cohorts have now been fully enrolled, and the safety and immunogenicity data from them will be shared when available. The NIH is expanding the trial to include two additional age cohorts, a 56 to 70-year-old cohort and a 71 and above age cohort. Each of these age cohorts will include three dose levels, also at 25, 100, and 250 microgram at the same vaccination schedule. In terms of the late phase development for mRNA-1273, as mentioned before, the phase two study is expected to start shortly. This study will evaluate the safety, reactogenicity, and immunogenicity of two vaccinations of mRNA-1273 given one month apart. Volunteers will receive either placebo, 50, or 250 micrograms at both vaccinations. This study will enroll 600 healthy participants in two cohorts of adults ages 18 to 55 and 55 year old and above. The study is meant to both increase our safety database as well as confirm the immunogenicity seen in the phase that we expect to see in the phase one. We are finalizing, as I said, the phase three protocol and the study is expected to begin this summer. Now, last week, Moderna Lonza announced its strategic collaboration with the goal to enable manufacturing of up to 1 billion doses a year, and this is assuming a dose of 50 micrograms. Technology transfer is expected to begin this June, and we anticipate the first batches of mRNA-1273 to be manufactured at Lonza's U.S. site in July of this year. I would be remiss not to mention BARDA's role in this. The BARDA award is allowing for us to move as quickly as we are with scale-up, both internally and with Lonza. Moving on to CMV, slide 20 reviews our late-stage development plans for CMV. As previously announced, the Phase two dose confirmation study is fully enrolled, and we remain on track for data readout in the third quarter of 2020. Importantly, greater than 70% of participants have now received their second vaccine dose. A protocol amendment was submitted to expand the time frame for the remaining participants to receive their second dose as well. As a reminder, we plan to select a dose for the Phase three after the first interim analysis, which is the data post the second vaccination. We continue to prepare for the phase three, which is intended to start in 2021 in the U.S. and Europe. During the first quarter of 20, we also received constructive feedback from a type C CMC meeting that we've had with the FDA. Moving on to mRNA-1893, our Zika vaccine program, let me recap on slide 24 the data that we recently presented at our Vaccines Day, where we reported an interim analysis of the ongoing phase one trial. This study uh, has demonstrated fairly benign safety profile consistent with what we've seen before for other vaccines. And at the two lower doses of 10 and 30 micrograms after a two-dose vaccination regimen, prime and boost, the seroconversion rates were 94 and 100% respectively. These data are encouraging and we are preparing to move forward with this program into a phase two trial. 
exploratory modalities are a critical uh, part of our strategy, and we can continue to make up a significant part of what we do in the clinic. And on slide 26, you see a If you scan the page, you'll see many readouts and catalysts from each of the programs, both from our core modalities as well as the exploratory ones. With that, let me now turn the call over to Lawrence. Thank you, Tal. Uh, let me first uh, cover uh, an update on the Vertex Agreement. In July 2016, we entered into a strategic collaboration and license agreement with Vertex aimed at discovery and development of potential mRNA medicines for the treatment of cystic fibrosis, or CF, by enabling cells in the lungs of people with CF to potentially produce functional CFTR proteins. In July of 2019, the initial research term was extended by six months. And based upon promising preclinical data generated uh, in March of 2020, we were pleased that Vertex elected to extend this collaboration for a further 18 months. Uh, now let me turn to financial results. Um, in today's press release, we reported our first quarter 2020 financial results. Uh, note that these results are unaudited. We uh, raised approximately $550 million in net proceeds from the February public equity offering, uh, which um, resulted in us ending Q1 2020 with cash, cash equivalents, and investments of $1.72 billion. This compares to $1.26 billion at the end of 2019. Uh, net cash used in operating activities um, was $106 million for the first quarter of 2020 compared to $144 million in 2019. Uh, and just as a reminder, that latter number includes an in-licensing payment of $22 million, which will not recur. Cash used for purchases of property and equipment was $6 million for the first quarter of 2020 compared to $8 million in 2019. Revenue for the first quarter of 2020 was $8 million compared to $16 million in 2019. Uh, this decrease of $8 million in revenue was mainly due to cumulative catch-up adjustments resulting from changes in our estimated costs for our future performance obligations. Coupled with the timing of amortization of deferred revenue due to the satisfaction of our performance obligations. R&D expenses for the first quarter of 2020 were 115 million compared to 130 million in 2019. Uh, the decrease of 15 million in R&D was mainly driven by a decrease in lab supplies and materials and clinical trial and manufacturing costs partially offset by personnel-related costs. DNA expenses for the first quarter of 2020 were 24 million compared to 27 million in Q1 2019. Uh, this decrease of 3 million uh, was primarily attributable to decreases in legal and other consulting and outside services spent. And net loss for Q1 2020 was 124 million compared to 133 million in Q1 2019. I'll turn now to what we expect for the remainder of 2020. If you look at our cash flow line items, you can see our cash used in operating activities and purchases of property and equipment uh, by, by quarter are laid out here. In Q1 of 2020, we used 112 million of, of cash on these two items, which is in line with our expectations. Uh, if you go back to Q1 2019, we used 152 million of cash on these two items. And remember, again, that number included that licensing payment. Overall, you can see the decline in our quarter-over-quarter quarter cash use for these items through uh, Q4 2019 with a slight uptick in Q1 2020. And so consistent with our initial 2020 guidance, which we issued back in November, we expect our 2020 net cash used in operating activities and purchases of property and equipment to be approximately $500 million. While we have seen parts of our spend slow down as a result of the impact of COVID-19, such as certain clinical trial expenses and laboratory supplies, we are also investing in preparedness for the late stage development and potential BLA filing for our COVID vaccine. That results in bringing our cash flow guidance back to its original levels. We recognize that much of our COVID vaccine spend is covered by the BARDA award. Note that the award is not cash up front, but rather reimbursement as expenses are incurred. Uh, we do expect to incur significant expenses this year in relation to that BARDA award, but we expect in general a matching of expenses and reimbursements. Let's drill down next on our balance sheet strength and the composition of the $2.4 billion of cash and available funding we have to invest and create value. Uh, we ended Q1 2020 with cash, cash equivalents, and investments of $1.72 billion. On April 16th of 2020, we entered into an agreement with BARDA to accelerate development of our mRNA vaccine candidate against the novel coronavirus for funding of up to $483 million, of which $430 million has been committed. 
Additionally, we are fortunate to have established strategic alliances with private and government-sponsored organizations, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, DARPA, and another BARDA award, comprising additional available funding of $180 million. Together, this creates multiple years of cash runway, considering the cash guidance that we share today, and a strong ability to invest for the long run in many aspects of the business. The next slide shows our pipeline and the programs through the various phases of development uh, with a snapshot here. But um, before I turn it back to Stefan, uh, let me just uh, reiterate an important point from my announced departure this morning, which is that I expect to seamlessly transition my responsibilities through August. Uh, but I'll make a, a brief remark now. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm so grateful to have been invited to be a part of this company. What an opportunity to contribute to Moderna's mission of turning mRNA into a new class of medicines. I joined the company six years ago. At a time when the story was nascent, the future was full of unknowns. Uh, I'm leaving now as the company has multiple BLAs on the horizon with 23 important new potential medicines in the pipeline, and I believe many more to come. We've invested heavily in the platform to establish the scientific foundations of this new class of medicines, and the team is growing with unbelievable new talent. I'm personally most proud of the financial foundation we've built to enable the company to invest appropriately in the business. It's been energizing and motivating to partner with Stefan, the board, its executive team, and the passionate Moderna employee base. For me, I'm eager to take the next step in my career, which will be to stay close to innovation in biotech, uh, but not as a company executive. Uh, I'll look forward to sharing more about those plans at an appropriate time down the road with many of you on this call. And with that, I'll turn it over to Stefan for closing remarks. Lawrence, thanks again for almost only your remarks, but uh, having you as my partner for those six years it has been quite an incredible ride. On slide 34, let me close by giving you a quick update where the company stands today, starting with our pipeline. It's exciting to see that today we have two candidates for which we are preparing for phase three of CMV vaccine and of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. We have now six candidates that are either in phase two or preparing for phase two, 12 phase one programs and 11 positive phase one readouts. What an acceleration since our IPO in December 2018. Our programs uh, are very exciting. We have seven first-in-class vaccines where there are no approved vaccines on the market against those viruses. Most of these vaccine candidates have multi-billion dollar annual peak sales opportunity. As we shared at our vaccine day presentation, we believe our innovative vaccines are going to be a very large business for Moderna with long-term annuity-like opportunities at a high EBIT margin. We also have five exciting immuno-oncology programs that are all in the clinic, that are all combined with a commercial checkpoint. Four rare disease programs and two autoimmune disease programs. The company has never been stronger. Look at our foundations. We have now doused more than 1,900 healthy volunteers and patients in our studies. The team is strong and getting stronger every month. We now have more than 900 employees who care deeply about our mission and are proud and energized by our progress and the meaning of our work. Last week, with the Lonza ag Agreement, our manufacturing capabilities has changed league. We not only have our fully integrated GMP site in Massachusetts, who many of you know and have visited, but we've added a strategic partnership with Lonza that can enable us to up to 1 billion doses annually for our vaccine against SARS-CoV-2, but also other products in our pipeline as we need to. We have great partners with AstraZeneca, Merck, and Vertex. I am very proud of the scientific progress that the team of Stephen Hogg and Melissa Moore have done in the work with Vertex over the last few years. And we are very pleased that Vertex decided to expand the relationship with Moderna. But we're also very thankful for a partnership we've had over the years with BARDA, DARPA, CEPI, and the Gates Foundations. And of course, we are very thankful for the latest partnership with BARDA, $483 million to enable us to do the right clinical study as fast as we go, of course, 
focusing on safety first for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And of course, we are well capitalized. We were up to $2.4 billion to invest in the business and continue to build the leading mRNA company in the world. We are very thankful for our investors for their trust and partnership as we build this unique company. We are energized by the opportunity ahead of us to build a new class of medicines. We are currently accelerating our development pipeline and readying the company to potentially file its first BLA for MRNA 1273, which will be, as you can appreciate, a historic moment for the company. We're investing in the processes to get us there, to get the right foundations for potentially many additional BLAs in the future, starting with the Zika vaccine and CME vaccines behind the SARS-CoV-2 MRNA 1273. We are already scaling up the organization to address the need to supply up to a billion doses for our potentially first vaccine MRNA 1273. All those efforts, investments, and processes will be very enabling for additional vaccines and therapeutics to come. I have never been as excited and optimistic about the future of Moderna in the last nine years. We are humbled and excited by the opportunity to bring forward a new class of medicines for patients. That has been our North Star since we started the company. I would like to thank the great team of modern employees working very hard every day, and literally many of them seven days a week now since January to fight the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I would like to thank the many people who participate in our clinical studies, including patients, healthy volunteers, physicians, and nurses. I'd like to recognize all our partners that work with us to share our vision and helping us to achieve this vision to help patients. With that, we are not happy to take any questions. Operator? Certainly. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound or hash key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from Matthew Harrison of Morgan Stanley. Please ask your question. Uh, great. Good morning. Thanks for taking the questions. Uh, I guess first, y you've highlighted the 50 microgram dose on the um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, and, and I think Dr. Fauci in his interview also talked about um, good responses and low doses um, in animals. Can you just talk about your confidence in being able to move forward and elicit the right kind of immune response with with the low dose as opposed to the other doses that, that you're testing. And then secondly, can you just update us on where the field is in figuring out um, what neutralizing antibody titers are and if you think they'll be available by the time you report um, initial uh, data from the phase one study? Thanks. So this is Taro. Hi, Matthew. Let me take that question. Uh, to, you know, spot on things that we're looking at. So first of all, um, 50 microgram is our current uh, best guess. We, you know, this is short of data, and it's based, um, you know, as, as you've seen Tony Fauci's remark on what we expect the platform could deliver. Uh, that being said, the final dose selection will really be a factor of, I think, three elements. The first is the overall sense of a dose response of, you know, how much more do you get as you go up in dose? Because in the case of a pandemic, we obviously need to balance this with uh, having uh, enough doses available. And so uh, you don't want to unnecessarily overshoot. The second element is an understanding of what that dose could mean as you compare it to convalescent serum. And so uh, there's a lot of work being done on assay validation, and I'll get back to that in a minute, uh, to understand what any given level of antibodies mean. Um, and the last element that I think will enable us to connect the dots is understanding the performance of the vaccine in additional um, animal models of SARS-CoV-2 and then seeing commensurate with 
the expected ability to protect those animals, what levels of, of titers do we get? And obviously, you know, the, the, the higher the species, the more reliable that data is, but ultimately what we care about is being able to connect the dots uh, for human disease. So it's a, it's a long story short, it's a best guess estimate for now and uh, based on the emerging data and we will continue to refine it as more data comes in. Your question about the right kind of immune response, look, I think the data we've seen to date, both across the clinical trials, across the experience that we have in the preclinical models, uh, across the board, uh, as, as I mentioned, in all the other clinical trials, we've routinely reported neutralizing antibodies as uh, the, the measure of immunological success. And if you think about the kind of scientific first principles of how an mRNA technology presents an antigen from within the cell and mimics the instruction set that a virus would otherwise give the cell to make an, an antigen, uh, I, we get the right kind of immune response, however you want to characterize it, neutralizing antibodies, Th1 versus Th2, et cetera. And, uh, the emerging data that we're seeing preclinically with uh, mRNA-1273 is all consistent with that. Uh, your final question on uh, neutralizing antibodies, Yes, those assays are being stood up as we speak. They're being validated. They're being uh, transferred to commercial vendors. And uh, the NIAID is uh, actively looking at that in parallel with, uh, you know, the simpler types of binding antibodies. We expect to be able to report both kinds of data when we see um, the data from that phase one. Great. Thanks for the thorough answer. Your next question comes from Corey Kazimov of J.P. Morgan. Please ask your question. Thanks for taking uh, my questions. I've got two of them for you as well. So I guess um, first, can you talk more about what the Phase 3 COVID vaccine design might look like? I mean, there's obviously nothing traditional about this program, so how should we be thinking about kind of like the endpoints in term analyses and amount of follow-up you think you need for either emergency use authorization or full approval? And then my second question for you is regarding COVID and also regarding COVID-19. There have been some conflicting reports out there on emerging mutations with the virus. Be very interested to hear your views on this and what it could potentially mean for the effectiveness of your vaccine. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Corey. Uh, this is tall. I'll take those questions. Uh, so, th look, the phase three design, let me make a couple of points. Any, any pivotal trial in order to demonstrate uh, efficacy as well as safety has to be placebo controlled and large enough so that uh, the people, uh, among the people that you will vaccinate, there will by chance occur cases, right? And so it's a case-driven design, and you set your statistics based on what you expect to see and how many cases you expect to see in the placebo, and then how, how many fewer cases do you expect the vaccine to demonstrate. Now, any such trial to be effective depends on three things, how big it is when you start, how good are you at predicting the attack rate in the population that you vaccinate, because if it's a case-driven uh, design, then, you know, we can – vaccinate a whole lot of people, but if they end up for the months to come not being exposed to the risk of um, an infection, then, then we won't know whether the vaccine worked. And the third element is how good our vaccine are is because the, the higher the point estimate for the vaccine efficacy, the clearer the results are and the sooner you can find them. Somewhere between those parameters, we are going to have to uh, have a conversation. It's ongoing uh, between us, our collaborators at NIAID, uh, at the NIH, and, and ultimately uh, FDA. The length of follow-up here and how soon can we see the data, I think, is a function of all those design elements as well as where you sort of set the bar for cases uh, and what expected benefit is. Now, you asked a, 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 an interesting question on you know, where does EUA come into this, where does approval, and, and what kind of interim data one could expect. So I think if, as you get closer to it, my sense is that we're not looking at a binary event in the sense that, you know, one day we know nothing and the next day it's suddenly available for everybody. I think as we learn more about the potential benefits, first based on phase one and two, and potentially uh, surrogate data and animal models, 
um, and, and understanding what those levels could mean from convalescent serum, we will gain more confidence as to the potential benefit of this vaccine. We will still not uh, be talking about um, an approval. We will not have a full safety database. But you start to generate an anticipation of potential benefit. And in the context of a raging pandemic, uh, I think that's important. The next step of data is then to get a sense that the vaccine is safe when given to a larger group of uh, individuals, uh, both healthy people, people with who are uh, older with comorbidities, and we need to go and build that safety database in the appropriate placebo-controlled dimension. And the final piece is then to actually demonstrate clinical utility benefit, and that requires to have an endpoint that's meaningful. Uh, and I think the two endpoints that are relevant for thinking about a pivotal trial are going to be COVID-19 disease. So however you define uh, disease, um, the appropriate symptomatology, severity, and uh, having a microbiological confirmation. And of course, infection per se is also a relevant endpoint because we know that asymptomatic people even if they themselves are asymptomatic, if you can prevent infection, you will, on a population basis, actually prevent others from getting infected and them being sick. So there's a benefit to society here of preventing infection, even if less so to the individual um, vaccinee. So between a disease endpoint and infection endpoint, I think that's where you're going to see uh, the, the pivotal trials in this space emerge. I hope that answers your question on the design. As we get closer to it, we lock it down with uh, the NIH and the FDA. We will, of course, be describing it in public. Your question regarding the emerging mutations, we're all following that closely. I would make two points here. Number one, so far from what we've seen, none of the mutations that have been described are expected to significantly interfere with binding or neutralizing activities uh, of antibodies generated to the full-length spike protein. And here I would make the, I would remind you that our mRNA 1273 actually encodes for the full-length spike protein. Uh, I think the mutation that everybody kind of saw last week had to do with potentially increased transmissibility, but that mutation doesn't necessarily uh, alter the critical neutralizing binding domains as we understand them. So we're clearly watching this this, this area closely like everybody else uh, to assess the potential impact. The second point I'd say sort of with a, a more longer term vision, should such a mutation arise and be relevant for the immunity of the population that's been exposed or the effectiveness of any vaccine, I would contend that actually our platform is going to be uniquely suited to address that uh, for two reasons. Number one is, as, as we've demonstrated, you can move very fast based on just understanding the sequence of a new mutation and you immediately generate a vaccine uh, against it. But importantly, as you look to the future, one could envision a world where if we've demonstrated um, efficacy and benefit against uh, this virus and, and the appropriate randomized controlled trials, if there's a slight mutation and you alter the vaccine to kind of chase the virus, the path to approval and expected benefit for the next one uh, should be much quicker. And you can think of uh, the way the world has evolved to deal with flu mutations, whereby as soon as there's a new sequence, that sequence is actually put into production and, and, and millions of doses of vaccines are generated. You don't need to replicate the entire phase one through three development path every time there's a minor mutation once you've established the platform. So as I look to the future, I think we're, we're in a very good place from the fundamentals of our platform uh, to envision that, that sort of uh, response to any rising mutations. Okay, thanks for the thorough responses and great to see the impressive progress you guys are making. Thanks, Corey. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press star 1 on your telephone. Your next question comes from Ted Tanez of Piper. Please ask your question. Ted, you might be on mute.
Operator, we'll come back to Ted. Can you go to the next question, please? Yes, your next question comes from Salvin Ritzer of Golden, Net, Golden Sex. The line is open. Hello, for Hello. What, were you looking at challenging animal models and then examining the uh, the antibody levels in humans? Um, and then a second question around, um, you know, with regard to um, supply and demand constraints, is the Lanza partnership, um, you know, really just kind of where you, I guess, is that is, are you going to expand beyond that uh, to kind of handle handle demand and supply? This is Paul. Let me try and take your first question. I think you got cut off, but if I understood you correctly, you asked whether we're running animal channel challenge models and whether we will be able to connect the dots between those and what we see in human vaccinees. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is yes. Uh, that work is ongoing. Uh, it's been done in close collaboration with uh, Barney Graham's team at the VRC of the NIH. And the assay development work that um, is ongoing is being uh, deployed so that we are able to connect the dots between the challenge models, convalescent serum, and the serum that we um, eventually expect to see from people who've been vaccinated. So I hope that answers uh, that question. So let me turn it over to Juan to talk about, or Stefan to talk about the Lonza question. Hello, this is um, this is Juan Andres, Chief Technical Operations and Quality Officer in Moderna. So let me take you. Let me take the second question that you have. Lonza brings um, an incredible track record in in, um, in supporting and manufacturing products worldwide. Um, Lonza's capacity, uh, together with the capacity that we have in our site in Massachusetts, um, and uh, and the capability, um, will be a great help for uh, uh, for Moderna scaling up and also producing the quantities. Um, we we are going to manufacture together with Lonza uh, the formulated bulk, and I expect that we will have uh, more partnership with existing um, with existing uh, CMOs for fill finish uh, and distribution, uh, and if needed, uh, uh, with new ones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from Ted Tenner with Pfeiffer. Please ask your question. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay. Sorry about that before. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for all of the hard work. It's been just an incredible run during this uh, last couple of weeks here, and the company's really risen to the challenges. Um, Lawrence, it's been so nice working with you, and I'm wishing you all the best, too. So my question actually has to do with CMV, and um, – I know you guys have talked about sort of the uh, challenges just with getting the final data sets and the final doses and all those things. So I wanted to see if there's an update on that and whether or not there's any changes to the expectation for data in the third quarter. And also how um, this general progress and investment in the vaccine platform will really help what you're doing in CMV. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ted, for the kind words. This is Tal. Let me try and um, take maybe both of those questions and Stefan can add on. Um, on CMV, uh, I believe we, we remain on track, and uh, it's you can do the simple math here. If we've already vaccinated over 70% of people with the second dose, and it's that critical post-second dose interim analysis uh, that should confirm our dose for phase three, if you recall the data from the phase one with much smaller numbers of subjects, we had pretty tight error bars and a pretty good understanding of the dose response curve. Now with a much larger study, even if it ran into some um, sort of difficulty because of COVID-19, uh, we're going to be more than powered to understand the immunogenicity and the size was really driven not just by the need to understand the immune genicity, but also to validate the safety profile that we see here. So I'm confident that with the numbers of people that we've managed to get into the second dose, the amendment of the protocols mentioned for the remaining less than 30 percent, 
that we will stay on track, uh, as we've uh, discussed before, to uh, have the data and be able to move on. And our plans for phase three uh, continue and remain fully on track for CMV. Uh, your question uh, on how it's preparing the platform, I'll give you sort of a, a brief answer from a perch of maybe medical and development, and then I'll let Stefan talk uh, as it relates to the company becoming sort of moving to its commercial life phase. Uh, the COVID experience is, 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 is doing really uh, three things for us. It is accelerating our understanding of the safety and immunogenicity at a much wider level for the platform, sort of the leading edge of data, if you will, and, and I expect that the ability to run a large placebo-controlled trial and expand the safety database at a much more rapid manner than we had so far in phase ones will be informative for all of us as to the performance of this platform, and here I sort of speak as a chief medical officer with a keen eye on the safety profile of our platform. So far, we've seen nothing unexpected, and it's all been sort of consistent across the application, but of course, um, a database of uh, 1,500 subjects will benefit greatly when we go into thousands uh, with COVID. The second element has to do with expanding our capabilities, building up a development team that can uh, integrate uh, and, and build a BLA file, building up our competencies on the regulatory front, the pharmacovigilance in front, et cetera. All of that ahead of a large phase three effort on CMV, I think, is is a tremendous benefit for us. And uh, I will sort of uh, I'll let Stefan speak to all the other elements where uh, this is accelerating the progress of our company. Thanks, Tal. Hey, morning, Ted. I would just add a few things. And I think Tal started to allude to it, which is the power of a platform, which really creates some very powerful network effects, where if you take an example of a, something new we shared today, which is, you know, we had a positive type C meeting uh, last quarter around CMV for CMNT, so for manufacturing. Uh, as you can appreciate, this dialogue we had with the agency around CMV phase three is going to be very instrumental in helping us on the phase three for SARS-CoV-2, amount it was 73. Uh, because of the uh, urgency that the agency has, we've had an amazing dialogue with the FDA. The responsiveness, you know, seven days a week, very engaged, very willing to find every way to shave a day for a process without making any shortcut on safety, obviously. So for this BLA process that we should be able to go through, you know, uh, in the next months, both on the uh, clinical side and also on the manufacturing side, this access to the agency, this ability to ask questions, to get clarification quickly, will really help us really build that capability within the team, but also the processes, all the digital infrastructure, in terms of data gathering, which is critical, both on clinical and on CMC, then you're going to be able to use that very quickly uh, on Zika, on CMV. Uh, and that, I think that's going to be very powerful. The network effect, I think, are sometimes underappreciated because uh, most companies, as you know, do not have platforms. Whereas here, because mRNA being an information molecule, there's really an ability to, to make Moderna uh, very robust and to take it to the next level. So that's what we do on SARS-CoV-2 BLA-wise, can be replicated much faster uh, and much stronger on, on Zika, CMV, and all the other programs. I think it'd be the same things around commercial, you know. Uh, with the arrival of Patrick, uh, we are uh, going to build very rapidly, you know, commercial infrastructure. We'll give you updates on that in the coming months. Uh, but as you can appreciate, all that work that's going to happen very quickly uh, on COVID will help us on the other products not only at the company branding standpoint, because as you appreciate, the Moderna brand has been transformed in the last few months because of the uh, results that the team has been able to accomplish, but also at the product level, at the scientific level, at the clinical level. So I think uh, the momentum of, of Moderna is going to be extremely strong and extremely enabled by the SARS-CoV-2 data fighting process. That's super helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ted.
Thank you once again. To ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Your next question comes from Yasmin Rahim, Efrat Capital Partners. Please ask your question. Hi, team. Thank you for the continued amazing progress that you're making day over day. Um, two quick questions for you. The first question is related to um, how are you, are you defining uh, age cutoff that in the phase two you mentioned there will be a cohort of patients who are 55 and above? Is there maybe a range uh, above which you're not going to be going after? And then is there going to be a cohort among the phase two and as you're thinking about phase three that are healthy but are at highest risk given that maybe they have obesity or uh, cardiovascular disease? Uh, how are we thinking about this patient population that are at the highest risk to incorporate that into the phase two and phase three um, uh, enrollment? Um, and then the second question is in regards to manufacturing, if you could help us understand uh, what is the single largest unknown when it comes to scaling up mRNA therapeutics? Um, and thank you for taking your question. Hi, this is Carl. Let me, let me start by answering the clinical ones, and then I'll let Juan take the manufacturing question. Um, the, in our phase two, there is no upper limit. Uh, I think above 55, you've seen the NIH phase one sort of parse it out a little bit uh, more finely. I think for us, uh, we're going to take all comers above 55 with no uh, upper age limit. In terms of your question on cohorts at higher risk for disease, should they get infected? This relates to both the elderly and people with the distinct comorbidities. As we build a safety database, obviously we need to get there, but get there responsibly. Um, I think the phase two, the initial um, sort of expansion into larger numbers is uh, people that do not have a high risk of disease should they get infected. In the phase three, we will clearly then open it up and we will um, do that in a manner that's responsible and takes the appropriate interim looks uh, to make sure that we expand into that population who needs it the most in a way that's uh, that's careful. And that's uh, an ongoing discussion, obviously, between us, NIAD, and FDA, how to best achieve that goal. Let me let uh, Juan take your manufacturing question. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Obviously, one of the one of the unknowns uh, was discussed before, which is the assumptions associated with those. Um, and then, in terms of the industrialization of the um, uh, of the product, uh, obviously, um, uh, where we're working very hard is in bringing the equipment, uh, bringing the raw materials, bringing the people capabilities together as we scale up. Uh, I don't think it is a, a very single unknown uh, in those. Um, uh, we have done this before, probably not at the scale up at which we are um, uh, going. Having the partnership with Lonsa gives me a tremendous uh, uh, confidence um, that, uh, that we are going to be doing uh, this very rapidly. And uh, obviously, speed is at the essence. Um, uh, bringing these three things together um, uh, is what, um, what it's all about, and, uh, and that's what we're doing. Yes, and maybe, Yasmin, just to, to add something, uh, we are extremely fortunate uh, to have Juan and his leadership team. Uh, as you know, he and the team have all come from large organizations. They have managed, you know, a very large manufacturing complex organization. Uh, they have a lot of experience. Uh, they know that every extra million dollars we can get out of our system will be helping a lot of people. So I'm very thankful for the team. They are literally working seven days a week, uh, you know, pulling all nighters to, to, to shave every day we can. Uh, so that we can really maximize the monthly output of the system, uh, and I'm tremendously thankful for them. Thank you, Stefan, and so are we. We're very grateful for all the work that everyone at Moderna is doing on behalf of humanity. Thank you. Your next question comes from Jeff Mitchum, is Link of America. Please ask your question. Hey guys, this is Alex on for Jeff. Thanks for taking our question. Um, and Lawrence, we're sorry to see you go, but assume you're moving on to bigger and better things. Um, so my question is on capital allocation in the near term. 
You reiterated your 2020 expense guidance, but I was hoping you could give a bit more color on the gives and takes within that vis-a-vis OpEx versus CapEx and how much manufacturing build out and commercial readiness activities for COVID-19 are reflected within that. And my second question is on the commercialization front. Do you intend to take the vaccine forward yourselves or do you think um, it will take partnering to deliver it at scale or would the U.S. government potentially step in as well? Um, Any color you can give uh, here and if there's some historical context you could point to, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, Lawrence. Um, let me handle the financial question. Um, with, with respect to uh, the guidance and the components, um, so um, as I mentioned, around um, sort of the, the 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 pre-COVID business, if you will, the, uh, I, I mentioned that um, we're, we're seeing a bit of a slowdown in expenses, opex related to um, you know lab work and uh, some of the clinical trials, as we've noted, and so those those expenses will. Uh, will be coming down uh, relative to what we thought when we originally um, uh, set out guidance. Um, the offset is, is um, investments that we are making to uh, be ready for all that's coming down the road. Um, we've mentioned this, uh, the, the rapid uh, uh, acceleration of, of the COVID vaccine timelines, um, and there's a lot that we need to do uh, as a company to be ready for potentially being commercial uh, in 2021. Uh, and so the, those offset, um, we will continue to, uh, update uh, you all as you um, as, as we as we, uh, as we scope those investments and as we move forward. Uh, with respect to capex, uh, it is not a, a, a huge uh, component here right now um, uh, of, of the anticipated budget, um, mainly because of the leverage we've got in um, in the platform as well as the the, the benefit of having um, a great partner like Lanza on board. Um, and again, we'll continue to update that guidance um, should anything change. Um, and then um, uh, the last uh, thing I, I would just reiterate is that uh, there is substantial um, OPEX uh, expected uh, with respect to the, the COVID vaccine work um, being funded by BART and the clinical development that scale up, uh, but that will be uh, paid for um, by, by BARDA, reimbursed on a, a very rapid cycle time. And so um, that's why I mentioned that there would be this matching of uh, expense and reimbursement um, through the course of the year, and that would substantially offset. Yes, thanks, Lawrence. And Alex, on commercialization, uh, as you can appreciate, uh, as we've said before, with the case of CMB, you know, we do not anticipate having the capability and investing to sell the products in our other party countries. Uh, for SARS-CoV-2, I think it's important uh, to think about the product in two different time horizons. There is a pandemic phase, in which obviously we all are, and then we believe as a company there is an opportunity for this product in the endemic phase, because we do not believe this virus is going away. Uh, so for the pandemic phase, uh, it will be mostly a partnership with governments. Uh, so in that case, you know, you don't have to necessarily manage uh, a complex set of potential barriers uh, because we're going to be, as we discussed, at the at the global level across the industry, we're going to be supply constrained for for some time, which is why, as we've said publicly many times, we are rooting for everybody who is working on the vaccine. We are hoping that many vaccines are going to a finish line because if you think about it, there are actually very few companies that have both the manufacturing scale that is required for the task ahead and are already in the clinic, meaning they can have a short to mid-term impact uh, with their vaccine. Uh, in my opinion, there are just a couple of companies uh, that have those two things. And so uh, if you think about it, in a, a very supply-constrained world in 2021, uh, it's going to be mostly partnering with government so that they will do the allocation in the different geographies. You know, we do not intend, for example, in the U.S., to decide who gets the vaccine. That will not be appropriate. Uh, so we uh, intend to continue our partnership with the U.S. government, like we've already done with NIAD and Dr. Tony's Farshi team for, for a few years, as you know, uh, and in the clinic more recently, uh, with BARDA uh, uh, and uh, eventually, uh, I assume, the CDC, to be able to supply to the U.S. government uh, the doses for them to decide the allocation 
that makes sense for the country. Great, thank you, and congrats on the rapid progress. Thank you. Your next question comes from Alan Kerr of Needham and Company. Please ask your question. Hi, thanks for uh, taking my questions and congratulations on your progress. Um, I've got a couple of them, um, given your increased focus and success with vaccines. Um, are you able to accelerate or what sort of extra emphasis are you putting on in these early stage vaccine programs? Uh, can you give us an update on 1345 and 1189, your RSV and EBV programs that are internal? Um, how are those moving along? And I know you don't uh, give high res info on timelines, but to the extent you can. Then the other question is um, around your COVID-19 program. To, to what extent is it feasible to have um, even an, an interim analysis um, of, of your, your planned phase three trial in, in 2020? Thanks. So let me start maybe with your first question on EBV and RSV pediatric. Uh, as you know, uh, we do not guide uh, on programs timelines. So the team is working on advancing those important vaccines uh, as fast as possible. Uh, but we have given no timelines and we will not give timelines. On the return as you appreciated over the, uh, the quarters to give timelines, we'll get closer to kind of late stage development. Uh, and especially with, with the SARS-CoV-2, given the pandemic and given the suffering around the world, we think it's important to communicate our best plans. And I, I hope everybody appreciate that when we say we aim to start a phase three uh, early summer, this is the best possible physical plan. Uh, 50 things can derail that. Uh, but for the early programs, we are not communicating. Tal, you want to take the, the COVID interim data question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I believe we should be able to have a sense of the cases and uh, a potential early look uh, by the end of the year. But again, that is a function of how soon can we start, how big the trial is, and how good are we at immunizing people who are then at risk for cases occurring? Because as I mentioned, it will end up being a, a case-driven design to be able to analyze it. And uh, we'll share the data, we'll, we'll share the details and the expectations once we lock down the design uh, with our partners and vet it with uh, the agency. Now, do you expect this to be just a U.S. trial or would you go global and I guess uh, another follow-up to this is, um, to, to what extent, I mean, I've heard talk about um, the possibility of a, of a larger trial with multiple vaccines. Are you contemplating that too, or is this, is this uh, the trial that you're planning to face through just a, um, a, a Moderna versus, a Moderna candidate versus placebo? Yeah. Uh, so, so let me take take both questions in turn. Um, this uh, first pivotal trial is going to be a partnership with uh, NIAID, with the NIH, so it will be at this stage uh, either a sole or predominantly U.S. trial. We're in parallel looking at opportunities to launch parallel pivotal trials in uh, Europe and, and globally because I think um, ultimately uh, the more data we have here, uh, the wiser we will be. Um, I think, uh, can you please remind me your second question? Well, I think you, I think you answered it. I was, I was wondering if, 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 um, if, if you were contemplating a, a trial, if the government was contemplating a trial. With oh, right, right, the multi-arm trial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's been a lot of talk about that, both on the WHO side as well as the uh, NIH. As, as you can clearly intuit, it's not front and center in my brain uh, for two reasons. First is um, we expect to be the first one out there for a pivotal trial, and so uh, we just have to get on and, and, and demonstrate our trial, our, our vaccine's potential. Uh, but the second one is more fundamental. I think it is important for... Uh, the field to use uh, more or less um, so it's an case where it actually makes sense to run 
many vaccines in a single trial. It's not like we're lacking for volunteers who would line up to be immunized and understand the benefit of a vaccine. And frankly, the epidemic um, is so unpredictable in where it um, shows up at, to what degree and how it comes down that there is no expectation of a consistency of attack rate over time that would make that, uh, you know, uh, add any scientific value. So uh, for my, this is a personal opinion here, um, I question the merit of, uh, of that design uh, from a scientific and a public health need perspective. I think what's critical here is that for every vaccine candidate, as Stefan alluded to, we're going to need more than one of them. But it matters less whether there's a, a few percent difference on the apparent estimate of the point efficacy. What matters is you know it works and you're able to scale it up and make it available to those who need it the most. Okay, thanks very much. Your next question comes from Govind Singh, is BNO. Please ask your question. Hi, everyone. This is Govind on for George. Just uh, thanks for taking our questions. Um, two on 1273. The first one would be, can you help us understand if there's any profit share agreements in place with any other parties, including the NIH, around the vaccine? And uh, just how do you guys see the commercial landscape evolving with so many other vaccine candidates in development? And then just to follow up maybe with uh, Naya's comments about their preclinical results that they saw, I understand they're probably doing their studies separate from you guys, but maybe you can help us understand what kind of preclinical results you've seen and when might this data be presented. That'd be really helpful. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's different. I'm going to start, and then the team might take the pieces uh, I drop. So uh, it is pre as, as Tal said, there's preclinical work being done both in our labs and at NIAID in Dr. Tony Sparchi's team. Uh, as soon as there is a, uh, a body of data that makes sense, makes sense and is complete and, and holistic, uh, we intend to publish that work. So, so as soon as it's public, uh, you'll be you'll be aware. Uh, in terms of uh, the profit share, we have not disclosed uh, previously uh, any arrangement, so I will not comment uh, on this one. And what was your other question? Um, the commercial landscape and how other coronavirus uh, yeah. vaccines are yeah. developing. Yeah, thank you. So uh, on the commercial landscape, as I briefly mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, as you know, I mean, there are 100 plus Last time I checked on Wikipedia, uh, vaccine candidates being worked on around the world. Uh, the, the, the thing I think that are important is, uh, you know, manufacturing scale and where are those projects in, the, in, in research of a clinic. Uh, as I said a few minutes ago, uh, I believe that the project that is at this stage in research with a group that doesn't have the ability to do 10 of millions of doses per month, ramping up to, you know, hundreds of millions per month, is not going to be able to have a big dent uh, on this pandemic. And so if you use those two as a screen, which is what uh, we do, uh, I think you end up with very few number of players that have, again, a chance in the 2021 time frame uh, to have an impact on this. Obviously, like, like always in drug development, not every candidate is going to get to the finish line. Uh, and I could also anticipate that once a few vaccines are in late stage or uh, commercially approved, a lot of the early projects might just uh, stop investing because they are deploying capital and talent uh, for something that might have no commercial end. So I think while there's a lot of people on the start lane, uh, my sense is very few are going to get to the finish line uh, with manufacturing scale that matters. Uh, one or two million, uh, you know, doses a year is not going to be uh, very, very helpful at the global scale. Thank you for your help Thank you. and all the progress you made. Thank you. Your next question comes from Justin Kim, is open high number. Please ask your question. Uh, <coughs> hey, hi, and it's, uh, it's actually Hartage on for Justin. Um, so um, one thing, first, Lawrence, uh, thank you so very much. It was a real pleasure working with you. 
uh, look forward to uh, seeing you again sometime in the future. Uh, and then secondly, um, just to Moderna, for all the work that you're doing, uh, I think people, a lot of people really don't understand uh, just the compression of the timelines that, uh, that you and the government are engaging in. It's really, really a thing of beauty. Knock on wood. So two questions. Uh, one is on manufacturing and uh, a second on regulatory strategy uh, worldwide. So on manufacturing, um, if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, going from clinical to commercial uh, batches. I know you've talked, um, it's found about going from millions to tens of millions to not billion with Lonza. Can you just talk broadly about the timing? You know, when can you go from that clinical? I know you've mentioned that Lonza will start manufacturing first batches in July. Uh, and how that maps against the BLA, you know, that you'll be starting to file. Um, and then secondly, on regulatory strategy, um, you know, Japan just approved remdesivir. I, I guess the EU is going through an approval process, uh, um, a fast approval process for remdesivir. So how are you thinking of the worldwide approval strategy aside from the United States, where I assume, you know, you'll file the BLA towards the end of the year? Uh, and thank you for the question. Uh, so, Akash, let me, good morning. Let me maybe start quickly on manufacturing. Uh, we have not, not done and not shared you know, precise output per month. What we've said is that given we're ramping up, you know, both Norwood, which we say could do up to 100 million doses per year at the 50 microgram dose, uh, and then the longer site, as you can uh, appreciate, basically every month this year, every month next year, the output per month is going to increase. Uh, and so, the team is working as hard as they can because they, they, they do understand, trust me, that every extra, you know, 100,000 vials we, we get out of, of the system uh, we will protect more people, we will slow down the spread of this virus. And so it's not a linear, you know, process where you start now at 100 million, you know, those per month, of course not. So it's just going to be an acceleration process, which is why this dialogue with the government in terms of allocation, and we're going to be hand-to-mouth for quite some time where as soon as the you know, product is made and QCD will go uh, to the government and then they'll decide how they allocate it and we'll just kind of be on a regular basis. Tal, you want to take the regulatory question maybe? Yes, thanks, Stefan, and thanks, Hartaj, for the question. Uh, look, we're, we're, we're in active dialogue now with uh, regulators beyond the U.S. I think having uh, the partnership with Lonza is a huge enabler to envision the ability to scale up and eventually supply the vaccine on a global footprint to those who need it the most. Um, that will take shape over the coming weeks and months. The expectation I have is that uh, we will do uh, more than one um, trial uh, to demonstrate the benefit. That being said, at a certain point, once you have data, both for potential benefit and ultimately for benefit, by and large, uh, that data should be applicable for filing in other territories. And so we're, we're actively mapping it out, and our intent is absolutely to uh, eventually be able to make this vaccine available to those who need it the most. Great. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you. If there are no further questions at this time, presenters, you may continue. So thank you so much, everybody, for participating, and we look forward to talking to you or seeing you at the latest on June 2nd for the Moderna Science Day uh, event and this team we host. Thank you very much. Have a good day and stay safe. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.